listening to the Treasury Update podcast presented by Strategic Treasure, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. On this episode of the Stories from the Front series, host Craig Jeffrey sits down with Ron Vodica, corporate FX dealer at XE, and Steve Johnson, CFO at PMI Foods, to discuss the changing expectations in foreign exchange amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Topics of discussion include market volatility through foreign exchange and hedging, supply chain and operational disruptions, currency exposure and risk management, and the vitality of adaptability and relationships. Listen in to the discussion to find out more. Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, today's host. I'm here with uh, Ron Vodica, who's the corporate FX dealer at XE, and Steve Johnson, who's the chief financial officer at PMI Foods. Wanted to uh, you know, start with you, Ron. I'm so glad to have you on. And I, I was just wondering, I think it'd be useful if people hear a little bit about the highlights of your career, and then not everyone knows about XE. So uh, maybe just give us a little bit of a view on your role at XE. For me, it all be- began just as uh, uh, I had a keen interest in international business, financial markets, and sales and marketing. And so I pursued you know, that as the direction of my career. When I graduated school, I ended up in Chicago and got into trading at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the futures market. And I worked for an options market making firm uh, doing the Delta hedging. From there, though, I recognized that maybe trading wasn't necessarily the right right route for me. So I transitioned into the bank side, working for uh, in a sales trader role in foreign exchange. Uh, and I did that at three different banks, um, beginning with Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, a large, which is now MUFG, a large Japanese bank, uh, ABN AMRO, which was a large European bank. And then most recently, I was with the US Bank uh, in North America. And that's a role I found very fulfilling. But then beginning this year in January, I transitioned to XE, uh, partly which is um, kind of a fin- in the fintech space of uh, offering payments, but also risk management to uh, kind of middle market, lower middle market firms, offering them you know he- risk management hedging alternatives, but also really kind of trying to push the envelope in the payment space. Yeah, very good. So when, when you say middle market, this is what some people classify as commercial market. This is up to, you know, one or two billion, or is this in the 500 million range? Well, I, get, I, I should have categorized that. So in my career, I've worked uh, in the foreign exchange sales trading role with all sizes of business, from the largest multinationals down to some of the smallest companies. The bulk of my career and the most satisfying part of my career has been in the middle market space, which I would define really as kind of two billion down to, say, 50 million on the lower end. The bulk of my career has been spent over the last 10 years working with clients really in the 1 billion to 100 million in annual uh, revenue range. Oh, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Ron. Well, Steve, I also wanted to uh, welcome you as well. Maybe you can give us an overview of PMI, uh, you know, the business overview, and then uh, your role as, as chief financial officer, some of your areas of focus. Okay. Uh, so PMI is a global food company. Uh, We started out as mainly a food trading business. We have now since moved into distribution as well as food service in various parts of the world. Uh, We source food products from the major, we are in proteins, so we sell proteins, which is meat and eggs. Uh, We sell, we mainly source our products from the largest meat producing markets in the world, which would be uh, North America, South America, uh, we actually have presence in Central America as well, Europe, uh, Australia, are mainly where we're sourcing our products from. And we then sell mainly to Asia, but we also have sales in uh, the Middle East, in Africa. We have sales in Southeast Asia. So we're in most parts of the world. And uh, we sell a, a fairly large volume. Uh, we sell between 20, probably 2,200 and 2,500 full container loads of product uh, a month, and that is either 25 metric tons or 52,000 pounds, depending on how you view it. And so uh, we, we really focus on sourcing what we can sell in these markets. Uh, our next, uh, and what uh, talking about my role in the business uh, as chief financial officer, 
I work with uh, finance and accounting. Treasury is under my role, uh, human resources, and also IT. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, pretty much every area of the the globe uh, you have responsibility for in terms of your business. And- yes, we're a corporate team in the U.S., and yes, we have responsibility for all of those functions, and we really touch uh, every continent but Antarctica. Now, now COVID, COVID broke in the U.S. Uh, middle of March. I know some of the regions of the world that uh, you operate in probably had an earlier, faster response. I, I'd like you to talk, maybe walk us through the changes that occurred around the globe because it seems like they cascaded uh, in different parts of the world at different times. Tell us what happened and, and give us a sense of the, the speed, maybe if there's a difference by region or just how that uh, impacted your business. Well, that's a great question. And it did impact our business differently by region. So in the beginning, I have always tend to go over to Asia, uh, to China. Hong Kong and China would be where I would go. And I would go uh, at the beginning, uh, end of the year, basically the end of our year, which is in January. When I say the end of the year, I'm there for our 1231 close, right? Make sure they're closing okay. And when I got there, you know, I'd read one article on a U.S. Uh, website talking about the fact that they had a, 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 you know, maybe what they called it a pneumonia type disease going on, a virus in China. So I went and thought, OK, that's fine. In Hong Kong, the folks that work for us in our Hong Kong office, they were bringing me masks saying, hey, you know, you ought to wear this when you go into China because they've got this virus. And I heard that it was in Wuhan. And so I thought, you know, didn't think that much about it. However, as I got to China, it became apparent that it was very serious. And upon my return, I did not have COVID-19. I got home okay. But upon my return, which was the 15th of January, it was starting to hit heavily in China. But a big problem that happened with it was that in the West, most of the people we deal with, which are the meat plants, they just viewed it as something that was going on far away. And so for us, it was already getting challenging as uh, supply chains were shutting down in China. There was significant disruption in the supply chain, but people didn't uh, really understand much about it here. In fact, I had some plants where we told them we might have cash flow challenges in paying them. They, one person was dumb enough to say, well, you should have thought about something like this. You should have planned for it. And I was like, okay, you don't know how bad this might become or how bad it seems to be. But then uh, in China, we saw it hit hard. And then, uh, you know, they had their shutdowns. And then in March, everybody in the Western world started to really feel that same pinch. And, And then when the shutdowns occurred, then I think everybody understood much differently what we were really dealing with. But it uh, escalated quickly and, you know, we don't need to go into the whole backstory now, but the, uh, as it escalated quickly, it, China has also recovered faster. And uh, so we saw it hit the Western world. And as we can see right now, we really aren't out of it yet in the Western world. Yeah, I know there's, there's more like the backstory and then some of the actions as well. But I, I also wanted to uh, maybe, Ron, start with you about this, the difference or the distinction between, you know, normal standard times and disruptive times. There's a, there can be a significant difference in the operations when we're, you know, everything's fine. There's not a virus or a, uh, or a series of wars or other types of disruptive events. You know, wh- what did you see and, and couple that with some of the perspectives um, and maybe we can start with you, Ron. I, I know you've got, you've got some stories about that. Yeah, I, I do, Craig. So thanks for the good question. I, I, I think I'd preface it by saying, you know, in my career working with corporations, there has been the trend towards uh, automation. And basically, how can, how can a corporation do more with less staff? And the way to achieve that is really just through embracing technology and driving automation. As any of us might know, particularly if you're on the older side even, technology is fantastic when it's working. It's when it doesn't work that suddenly all the problems can come. And the question is, what do I do and how do I solve it? So the reason I kind of mentioned that is in my experience working with, with treasury groups at corporations, particularly as we say, even as you get into middle market corporations, where maybe you don't have quite as extensive the depth of the size of the treasury group compared to a large multinational, 
when everything's flowing fine, it's great. The file upload to send the outgoing disbursement of wires to the bank goes smoothly. Um, you know, just everything, every element of your automation goes great. So it's particularly to foreign exchange as there has been a migration towards automated trading platforms, which connect ultimately to their counterparties through, let's say, FXAll, 360T, there's CurrentX, Bloomberg, variety of methods, maybe even a direct transmission channel directly to one of your counterparties. Uh, again, when everything's great, it flows fine. The bid ask uh, on the FX rates will be tight. There's ample liquidity and you can just bang it out. But what happens when those rare moments come, which, you know, uh, if those who are around for the 2008 great financial crisis and then also now the COVID crisis is when it goes wrong, it can go really wrong. And what was intriguing was the, the COVID crisis starting in March in the financial markets, just when it hit, it hit really hard. And as we saw with the equity market tumble, um, we also saw the exact reverse in the US dollar soaring higher. The challenge can be um, the trading counterparties who uh, provide the liquidity to the markets, when they get to extreme levels, they're gonna shut off the automation, right? The bid ask in Euro, which might be like, you know, let's say it's around, you know, 116.50 now, normally would be 116.50, say 116.54 or something like that, bid versus offer. It can be where the, the trader will quote, 116, 117, you know, 100 pips wide, or they're not willing to make an offer or a bid. And so I think what I've noticed in my career, uh, we happen to have like the two large magnitude events, the great financial crisis, and of course, the COVID uh, back in March extremes. But even during, you know, um, smaller extremes, uh, corporate treasuries are sometimes unaware, and perhaps maybe the junior staff, but it could also be the senior staff, unaware of the counterparty side or the bank side or whoever they're trading with. And that trader is making a market and they just assume there always is a market. And what can happen is when these big events hit, there is no market and it can create uh, frustration and flustering to the staff who was kind of unaware, why is it my FX all trade going through as seamlessly as, as normal? Why am I getting this bad rate? And um, I think it's a function of just a lack of awareness uh, oftentimes by the treasury group of the other side of, of the transaction. Yeah, that's that's great. It's not, it's not a problem with the tech. It's a problem with the markets not there. There's probably more you can say, too, but I want to I want to pull Steve in here, um, you know, to this. Uh, you know, did that match your experience? What what were some of your stories from from this time with uh, this volatility in the market? Uh, well, it's interesting, too. There's a there's a couple ways that I would look at it. Number one is you know from as Ron talks about with counterparty risk. I mean, banks uh, from our my perspective, you know, on the other side of that equation is they're looking at their counterparty risk. They everybody likes to look at their mark to market. And when we saw things, now we are uh, exposed as we we mentioned. You know, we are exposed in currencies where we source. So that's the euro and uh, the pound typically. Uh, and we were also exposed where we sell, which would be uh, where we're selling in Japanese yen. But we're also selling in South African rand, which is a more you know exotic, volatile currency. We also have some exposure in Hong Kong dollars, which is the exact opposite of the spectrum. But everything looked good, looks good, or for us, you know, looked pretty good. And then all of a sudden, you see scenarios where maybe you have a huge. For me, it actually went the right direction in the beginning, but. The South African Rand, we ended up with a very high mark to market. Had we gone the other direction, though, then you wonder how nervous people are getting as the banks because we have a very large mark to market loss potentially. In our case, we ended up with a mark to market gain, but that was one that was interesting. And, and sometimes I think because it was so volatile, if you have a huge gain in their minds, banks may think, counterparties may think, well, they were lucky this time to get the gain, but next time we could have a big loss. And really, it's not in my mindset to be somebody who would walk away from hedges that I had on the books, but that's what they're worried about. And uh, you don't know, you know what your situation is, but I think Ron is, brings up a great point is things were going well and everybody was, things were working okay for us. But what if you were a scenario where they were not, where things were not working very well and you were already a little bit on the ropes, then these types of things are very volatile. And, and as a, from a counterparty side of the banks, they don't want to, they, it makes them very comfortable, uncomfortable, excuse me. The other issue is from this volatility is you're going to see situations where the market has moved tremendously, 
Can you take advantage of it? Can you act quickly enough or is it really hurting you? And maybe your models that you have run will show you that we're okay trading in these ranges or hedging in these ranges. Maybe you have a budgeted exchange rate that you're using for the year. Well, you can have scenarios where you're completely outside of that rate instantly. The other thing we saw, and I'll speak about two currencies, was the South African Rand and the Japanese Yen. If you look at historic trends, and Ron could, could actually check my, my facts here, I'm uh, going kind of off the top of my head, but we haven't seen the yen as low as the 101 range for several years, maybe up to five years, as strong a yen as the 101.5, uh, which it was for a moment, a brief moment when the COVID overreaction started. And so I was lucky enough to be able to lock in some currency that day because I just happened to be watching my phone on a Sunday night, which saw that I showed the rates on, uh, I'll give Ron a plug on his app, XE. It's a great app you can get on, um, on, and you can get on your iPhone or whatever phone you, you use, you can get that rate to see it. But on the other side, also uh, the South African Rand almost reached a 20 to the dollar, which is unheard of, and then it pulled back. But the question you have to ask yourself on the days of the crisis, is this the end or is it going getting worse? So in other words, could we see a yen strengthening to 90 within a matter of days? I mean, to see it, it move that much, five yen points, five yen, yen in, in a, a matter of a day or over a weekend is very unusual. And so the question is, how do you react to those types of trends? And, uh, you know, you don't want to get caught on the wrong side, but it was very volatile to watch. And then you wonder what happens now. I mean, we're seeing what's happening in Europe today uh, with the COVID cases. Are we going to see the dollar strengthen? Because everything from an economic perspective is telling us the dollar should weaken, except for the uncertainty with the cases in Europe. Yeah, excellent. Um, Ron, did you have anything you wanted to uh, add to that? So after Steve's uh, mentioned dollar yen, uh, I had the luxury, I took a quick peek and it was Q4 of 2016, the last time uh, the yen was around or broke near the 100 level. But what, what you know, in noting, looking at the chart again, dollar yen was trading at 112 just the week before. So it took basically a 10% move uh, in just one week. And that's significant, right? So for Steve's business, which operates, uh, or he's conscious of the margins that they operate on, um, the FX rate is an important component of all their transactions. And Steve alertly, you know, just as, you know, as I learned of the company XE through Steve, but a lot of CFOs monitor the market on our app and he was poised and ready to act. Um, but all the currencies were moving and uh, it, is, it was the extreme volatility. And uh, it's, it's not easy to um, pull the trigger always because you think, oh, sometimes it could keep going. And as Steve mentioned, maybe dollar yen was going to go through 101 down to 95 or even to 90 because it has been there. And this was a very unique time. But I give him credit because he also knows his positions. He knew the contracts that he had. Maybe he had confidence because he's selling proteins that, you know, at the end of the day, people need to eat. And, uh, you know, the, the, will his counterparty back out on their contract? Probably not. Um, and he was willing to execute and he caught the dead low and then it was 5% higher, uh, probably just two days later. And, um, and he got a great transaction in, but of course it's not about, um, picking the higher, the low It's Steve recognizing that he had a contract, that he had business that was going to get executed and the market had given him an opportunity and he acted. So that volatility trans transfers to all markets, right? The Australian market saw that the FX rate drop 35%. Uh, same thing for the New Zealand, the Kiwi, and um, it really just created incredible disruption. And Steve is right. Uh, counterparties of trades are looking at mark-to-market positions, and it can really uh, strain a relationship. And it's not just FX. It could happen on an interest rate portfolio or a commodity portfolio. And that's where I think it really behooves a corporation to, I would say, because I'm on the other side of the equation, not take their bank or trading counterparty for granted, kind of realize that they are your partner. Certainly there's uh, the exchange rate component and then there's you always wanna get the best rate and you wanna make sure that whoever you're trading with is giving you a fair rate. But also you need to know that they're running a business as well. And the more 
information you share or the better your relationship with your trading counterparty, uh, I think the better it is for your business. And again, it's not the 98% of the time when things are smooth, but it's when the relationship kicks in, when the 2% of the time happens and things are difficult. And Craig, well, the other thing I'd just like to add in, just thinking about liquidity, which is the primary function of you know, when in extreme moves, liquidity dries up. But there are other times when liquidity dries up. It's on a Friday afternoon. So I, in my career, I've had many a, a, a corporate client come across um, after 2 p.m. Pacific, where I'm in Pacific, which is, you know, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Mountain. Um, but the FX markets close on a weekend. So on a Friday, there is no market after 2 p.m. Pacific time. And, you know, a trading, a treasury group needs to know that you can't put through a 10 million euro trade at that time. You could probably do a 100,000 euro trade, no problem, but not a 10 million euro uh, trade. And same thing when you get the opening on Sunday afternoon, North American time with the New Zealand or the APAC region, starting with New Zealand and then Australia, it's relatively thin trading. And I think the only other thing I've, you know, mentioned to your, to the treasury teams that we're maybe talking to is that not all currencies trade equally liquid all the time. So we're seeing more and more interest in dollar Indian rupee and say even dollar um, Central Europe, where a lot of uh, software companies or software as a service businesses are hiring developers and needing for payroll and paying for staff. Th those currencies are not always liquid 24 hours a day. So the Indian rupee shows its greatest liquidity certainly during the Asian hours and then during the London hours, but it certainly uh, uh, diminishes during, you know, once London tunes out during the day. Uh, also, the Canadian dollar is really a North American currency. It's not really traded uh, in Asia. Certainly, you can always get a market, but it's just, again, there is not really a trader um, in Beijing or in Singapore or Australia, uh, maybe Australia, but like looking to have a long, a really big position in the Canadian dollar. So I just think, Again, the teams need to be conscious of the variables that go into making good pricing and good liquidity. Yeah, appreciate the, uh, the, the movement and discussion about some of the different currencies and how the markets operate normally, as well as this uh, disruptive time where they you know, dried up. Um, you know, just you know, continuing the discussion about this impact of the disruption, um, I don't know if there's any other, other items you had or lessons learned. You know, you talked about uh, the mark-to-market swings that happen, the stress on the counterparties. Um, yeah, this put perhaps a, a, a challenge on the ranges that you wanted to be hedged. Any, anything else? Um, anything else happened uh, operationally or with your trades? Well, there was. I mean, operationally, there's really lots of things occurred, and you can kind of look at them from a. Uh, different uh, situations. So for us, it became very challenging. A couple of things that made the challenges worse. Uh, for example, we were uh, expecting certain things to happen at meat plants that didn't always happen. So some of them were shut down by COVID. Some people were able to ship products. Some people were not able to ship products. We were really on a night by night watch to see who, if anybody, was going to get uh, shut down or get delisted, as we call it, from China. So they would not accept a shipment. When that happens, we're really scurrying around like crazy to understand when is that, uh, when does that occur? It is as of what date? It is production dates of such and such a date. Other situations are maybe the, the, the things are arriving. That was very difficult. Uh, in the heart of COVID at the very beginning, a big thing that happened to us from an operational basis, which was probably the, one of the hardest things I've seen in my, you know, almost 15 years here at PMI, was uh, the Chinese ports shut down. So when China went into the main lockdown, they really locked it down tight. It's a scenario that I think as a Westerner, we really don't understand how shutdown, shutdown was. And so at that point, goods are arriving at port, uh, they are then uh, stuck at port or, uh, which was a tough situation for us, always is, is that they decide, the, the boat decides to do, you know, stop at a transshipment port. So it's kind of the analogy of you're flying from Atlanta to, to LA and you, all of a sudden the plane stops in Houston, Texas. Why did it stop in Houston, Texas? Just because it did. And there's really nothing you can do to get back going again. So those were extreme disruptions for us. 
Also, there was problems with plants. But remember, with a, a business like ours, as was with the case with most food uh, related businesses, food service businesses around the U.S. did this, and now they're doing this around the world, which is we have uh, purchased a product that we expect to be sold to somebody else, consumed by the end user, repayment received, and cycle again, right? That's what our cash flow cycle is like. What happens though when you actually can't get your product even out of the port in China? So that means people aren't paying you quickly. Maybe they can't pay you at all. And by them not being able to pay you, then you're not able to pay your plants as quickly as needed. An interesting thing in our business, and it depends, but varies by region, but U.S. businesses expect to be paid really on net seven day terms. They've already paid the rancher for the cattle, let's say, and uh, you can't string them out to net 30 days. So there was a lot of those challenges that hit us. And, you know, sometimes in retrospect, I wonder how we survived, but we did. <laughs> so we worked with uh, partners, we worked with banks, we worked with plants, we communicated, over communicated with our, our major uh, partners, let's say, both on the external side, but uh, meaning like banks, but also with our plant partners. But there was a lot of that that hit us and really, but uh, I'm not understanding, you know, in, in what had gone on in China or trying to understand that the ports were closed, but that meant, okay, now the port is open. Does that mean there's a trucker that can drive to the port? So now we have a port open and a trucker that can drive to the port, but we don't have a warehouse that is able to accept the product. So those were crazy, crazy things that we saw in the early days. Now, by the time the Western world was feeling the pinch of COVID. We were actually, I wouldn't say recovered, but China was nearing back to normal. So by in April or May, we were, we were kind of on the opposite side of it. Now we were seeing that uh, things had recovered in China, so that allowed our business to get back on its regular cash flow cycle. But everybody has faced, as we've seen, that same cash flow cycle interruption. Yeah, whether that was uh, for a month or two months, that might be uh, interesting to explore at some point. Um, I want to I want to keep the discussion on you for a second, Steve, and then jump over to to Ron. You know, talking about adaptability, right? This in a disruption, you have to adapt quickly. What ad adaptations were the most notable uh, from your side? And you already talked a little bit about communication, making sure you're over communicating or talking with the different partners. But are there other adaptations that are worth sharing? Yes, I think so. Really, I view it this way, and it's an analogy I make to some of the people that work with me, some of my staff, is it's kind of make this joke that says, you know, it's kind of like a game of musical chairs. It doesn't get interesting until uh, the music stops, and then you figure out what the problem really is. And so in the beginning, things are moving along quite well, and things are going okay. So for us, really what uh, kind of learnings or things we tried to emphasize on is, okay, what is our most important uh, what are we trying to do really as a finance function? We have some balance sheet issues, maybe related to inventory, potential losses in inventory. Uh, we also have some income statement issues. Maybe we're going to lose money this quarter, have to keep the banks happy there. And, uh, and really from a cash flow perspective is what we looked at. But ultimately, a lot of it, I think for us, the, what we tried to do and employ our strategies was understand first and foremost our cash flow positions. And you know it, it's as dumb as this sounds, and Ron brings it up about automation, is uh, do you have a report that actually tells you your cash flow? How closely do you monitor this cash flow? And I think from, from my role as CFO, I mean, we, we need to delegate, we need to have teams that are doing what they do so you don't have to be caught up in the minutia on a daily basis. But in a cash flow crunch, understanding really what you owe, who you owe it to, which partners are you able to, uh, perhaps I hate to say this word, but stretch a little bit? Which partners can you not stretch? What are your really most important uh, cash flow decisions to make? And so I always view it like uh, kind of the waterfall. You fill up waterfall one, pool number one with a certain amount of money, what's left to move to pool two, what's left to move to pool three. But those are things that you have to change on the fly when uh, changes happen in specific uh, cash flow cycles. So things that you always have seen happen for years and years and years in, this, in the situations which we face this year, they just didn't happen. You can't count on things that you always counted on. So 
we've tried to kind of, this gave us an opportunity to, to stress test our models. And we know some things now that we didn't know back then, but uh, we have a different procedures that we're doing every day. We still haven't really gotten out of that habit of our daily, every other day review of some of these cash flow cycles to really understand. And now we're feeling pretty good. But then again, we're seeing challenges are hitting. Look at Europe right now, hit again. So could we have trouble with our European plants not being able to ship? So all of that is something that we've just kind of incorporated in, in our minds of what we do weekly, or at least what we know we can do to go back to that crisis survival mode if we need to. Ron, I wanted to uh, to bring you on, in on that too about adaptability. And Steve mentioned about tech, but how does how does tech help you become adaptable? You started off earlier talking about how tech uh, can sometimes fall apart because there's no market or you have an over reliance on tech. But how uh, how can tech help us with the adaptability? Well, it's a great question, Craig, and thank you because uh, er- earlier. Um, I was basically saying, you know, um, when things go wrong, how tech cannot work. And if you understand how the markets work, then you, you can react to that. But what I would add in here is that everything is so fast now, right? I mean, you look back to the Great Depression, uh, the 1930 or 28 through 32, you know, it was, it was several years. Great financial crisis that came up with quantitative easing and, and central bank responses. Um, and things took like, what, a year and a half or so to recover, right? In March of 2020, uh, the central banks of the world acted in harmony and um, were, were on it. We're literally within you know one to two weeks uh, of the crisis. So it, everything happened so fast. So with technology, one thing I can provide as the counterparty is we talk to lots of companies. So I would say to other treasury, you know, the treasury treasury staff listening, a valuable resource can be your uh, salesperson on the other side because they can not only tell you what's happening with you, but what's happening with other companies and help give you an insight into how other companies are reacting. Um, so what, one of the biggest trends I've seen is the reduction in speed of the FP&A cycle. Um, some companies still are more traditional, have longer sales cycles. Maybe there's, uh, you know, the movement of goods and contracts are longer. But with the advent of the internet and online businesses, some companies, you know, are redoing FP&A cycles every month. And so what Steve did when dollar yen went down to a 101.50 and he could act was because he knew his business, he knew his margins, he knew uh, he'd been in touch with the sales team and he knew this contract was valid or he had contracts that are valid and he, and he could execute. Technology, you can be very well prepared, right? You can, you can know, you can get constant updates to your sales forecasts. Um, you can have, you know, your business, uh, you know, expectations of what's going to happen over the next several months, you know, ready, ready information that you can act on. Also, maybe put a probability on it, you know, a sign that, okay, I think only 80% of this will happen, 60% of this will happen. Therefore, I'll only be comfortable hedging a certain amount or taking action on a certain amount. Um, But I think that's the biggest uh, change. And I saw this with one of the tax holidays that the U.S. government gave to overseas earnings a while back. So this is going back maybe five, six years ago. Um, But there was one company it was like on June 1st, the tax holiday started and it was June 1st by like 7.30 a.m. And they banged out, you know, 500 million euros like in the next 20 minutes, right? They were the first trade to come through. Everybody had talked about it, but they were prepared. So my takeaway was that company was so well organized, you know, cohesion between the finance, treasury, operations, tax, legal groups, they brought it all together. So, um, and you can see when companies don't have that. So I guess my answer is, you know, technology and systems allow companies to be really well run. Um, they have information at their fingertips. Um, and I guess my thought is always when, when times are quiet, uh, make sure you run like a, a, a good, a clean group. Because then, you know, the Boy Scouts about being prepared when, when the crisis does come, you know, you, you don't have to spend time gathering information. You have the information. You trust that it's there and you're ready and prepared to act. And so I guess I would say, you know, continue to leverage your partners for information on what others are doing. That's something I think treasury groups should do. They can get great insight or, or confirm that what they're doing is correct. And then also I would just say the speed of execution uh, is so fast that you do need to be prepared and ready to act because market movements, you know, you can't really wait even 24 hours anymore. You have to just know uh, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready to act. I want to do this and I need to act now because if you wait 48 hours, which I've done many times in the stock market and watched it go against me, um, 
you know, you just, uh, that, that, that speed and need to act fast is a, a really interesting development of the technology era. Speed matters is a clear statement of what you said. And uh, maybe you can help, help balance this. I don't know if these are all even or if one's more important than the other. I, he- I heard about tech is important, but you can't rely on it exclusively. Relationships matter, particularly in crunch times. Uh, the business understanding and the ability to act fast is also, well, let's just say particularly vital in disruptive times. Um, are, are you giving those equal weights or, or how would you uh, how would you calibrate that? That's a, a great question again, Craig. So thinking about it, straight through processing and automation is what drives the results, right? It brings costs down, drives efficiency. You want to go that route. All I would say is uh, the treasury teams, and maybe it starts with the senior management, making sure the younger people are just conscious that it can all disrupt and be prepared in their back pocket. So I would say if I had to give equal weighting, it's the speed, it's the use of technology, having great information, having your decision tree uh, ready to go, knowing your line of command, all that is more important. But in your back pocket, you just have to be conscious and ready that when there is disruption, um, that you understand why it's happening and just don't have an expectation that markets will be as liquid on Tuesday as they were on Monday, uh, but there was an earthquake overnight. So um, I hope that answers the question, but I, I think straight through processing drives results. So that's, that's the most important aspect. I think when we talk about technology, you know, the question is, what are we thinking about? How basic do we want to make it be in that answer? And so I would say this, you know, it maybe states the obvious, but you know, for my business, I can take advantage of having people all over the world. I mean, we say we're six, you know, continents, you know, the old British Empire joke, the sun never sets on PMI. You can actually use that. Uh, we've really found in these scenarios, we use it to great benefit. Because if I want to talk to somebody in Asia tomorrow, I just wait till six, five o'clock tonight, I've got a person I can talk to. And how do I do it? Well, you know, it gets a little annoying, but we got 101 ways. We got WeChat, we got WhatsApp, we got Microsoft Teams, we've got email, we've got text, we've got everything in the world that you can talk to people, but they're collecting information and reading things and seeing things that we don't have. So it's a 24 hour global economy now. And then if you can take advantage of that, like we talk about the XE app, but how do we know? I mean, I've gotten to the point, it's probably a bad habit, but if I wake up in the middle of the night, I can look at my phone and see what the uh, what the currency markets are doing. And I don't know that I can do a heck of a lot about it, but sometimes I actually could. And maybe that's the case if I'm traveling in Asia, I can call back to someone like Ron and say, oh my gosh, what is going on? But that's the greatest way, in my opinion, to use technology is we're just constantly plugged in. Now, there's probably some uh, other issues, mental health issues, social issues that don't make that great, but you have to take advantage of it in the situation and you've got that ability. So that, in my mind, the simplest technologies may be the most effective in managing disruption. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the uh, sleep disruption for, for another podcast, but uh, no, the point's, uh, the point's well taken. Um, I wanted to shift uh, for the last main topic uh, on the economic side. And, and Steve, maybe we can start with you. So, you know, you're, you know, you're not able to deliver things. You might have a problem with the plant. Uh, you know, a number of different activities can change uh, what you're shipping, receiving, billing. You could end up over, under hedged. What happens when that occurs economically? What are, the, what are some of those challenges? It's a significant challenge. And, and see, for us, uh, we're trying always, as Ron alluded to, we have... Uh, are a high volume, low margin business. And, you know, we can look at what a food service margin might be. You know, you're looking at what's publicly available, like a Cisco Foods, a U.S. Foods. You can see they make about 15% gross margin. The trading businesses are lower than that. So we have very little margin or very little room for error. So it's, it's a very difficult time to end up in a situation. So as far as that economic comment goes, That's one reason why you never want to speculatively hedge. That is a very, very difficult situation. And we all think we're right. And, you know, another old joke, you know, it works really well until it doesn't, right? And when it doesn't, it doesn't. And you get involved in a big hit. So some of that is also when you look at use of technology, I mean, through your ERP system, through whatever you're doing, you really need to understand what kind of uh, exposure you really have. Honing in on your own exposure making sure you really understand that. 
And if not, if you get into the position that you really are overhedged, uh, that's when I reach out to the, the Rons of the world to really help us understand what we think is going on. Now, it, it's never perfect, but there are some trends. You know, the, the nice thing about FX is it nothing ever goes for zero, nothing ever goes to 100. I mean, it doesn't and under, especially if you're dealing in currencies that are not uh, so exotic or volatile, you can probably watch them move around a little bit and then maybe find better ways to unwind a position. Uh, it's scary and it, it feels good when you're able to do it and it works okay. It doesn't feel good when it goes the other direction. But really, what I found in my time you know, working at PMI, I was international focused in another job a little bit, not to this level. Uh, we're basically 100% export. We have only maybe 2% uh, U.S. domestic business. So I was able to learn things that I think I learned new back in the old college days, but really they weren't as clear in my mind about economic trends and what's really going on. What happens when a central bank does something? Uh, because that's where you can't, you've just got to be proactive to try to find out as much information as you can and uh, act in the, the most prudent manner. And, and I have to say, I've, I think I've been pretty fortunate in how that's turned out for PMI, but it could have just as easily gone the other way. So honing down exposures and really being on top of it, it it's not a job you can casually look at. And it's kind of like the stock market. You can't look at that, can't look at that stock uh, once a month and understand what's going on in its uh, pricing to move accordingly. So it's something that you've really got to look at yourself. But as I mentioned, there are experts out there, uh, XE, banks, people like that can help you really make some decisions that you might have to make if you find yourself in a position that you don't want to be in. Ron, I, I didn't know if you wanted to add to that or jump in on the, the discussion about economics. I mean, I guess there's a, there's a way you respond maybe operationally or analytically to these situations. And it, it can be, you know, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to weigh in on. You know, Steve and I've known each other for a while, and and honestly, he's one of the best uh, at at managing their corporate risk, and it's partly because you know, like I said, he knows his business inside and out, and he's very connected at the pulse of the sales and and the uh, the um, importing side, I guess, or the cost of goods sold side. Um, but what I, what I would say is a like a broader brushstroke is. You know, certainly uh, all these things that you do, I guess I made the Boy Scout analogy, but being prepared, you know, if you can stress test periodically, just know your extremes. When, when, when does it really turn bad for you, right? Do you have an intercompany loan that you're going to blow a covenant if the FX rate moves? Um, is there some point where you turn negative and I just like this deal no longer makes sense? What are we going to do? And usually what people do, and you could say probably in the equity markets and, and you know, interest rate markets as well, um, but they freeze when it goes against them. And of course, they're happy to react when it goes in their favor. And then I find it gets actually quite skewed risk rewards where you'll find people on the take profit side. So again, if they wanted to buy euros and they wanted it uh, 116.50, but oh, it goes down to 115. Woohoo, I picked up one and a half percent or so, right? I'm going to buy. Or they'll then watch it if it goes at once from 116.50 to 118 to 120 to 122, and they'll watch it go against them. So what I've worked with Steve and other clients a lot with, I'm like, have a valid risk reward model. You should always be wanting to get more reward than risk. So meaning, you know, if you're going to put a buy level at a, you know, an opportunistic buy level at a certain amount, make sure you don't watch it go against you the other direction by that amount or greater. That's that's a bad that's a bad trade. And what I've worked, learned with Steve is, um, and I think back to uh, when President Trump uh, won the last election, um, the euro uh, kind of took off. And um, it. Uh, so I work with stop losses, meaning everybody, you know, again, as Steve's a buyer of his business is a buyer of euros, right? Uh, he wants the rate to go down. But if it's going higher, again, rather than watching it, we always talked about is there a point where you just need to buy, right? Don't let it, not letting it get away from you and place a stop loss level. It gets triggered. Usually you're bummed out that it gets triggered, but you know what? Oftentimes a week later, it's 2% higher. And boy, are you really glad that you placed that stop loss. So I just think, you know, as, as for a treasury team that's that's running a business, maybe even younger people, right? They're, they feel like they're trading, so they get a little excited about it, but also be conscious of where you're, um, what kind of a stop loss level is and at what point do you need to really just buy it and then move on, right? And be able to walk away, uh, which I think is very important. 
mindset to have because again, I just see people get frozen. So I think that's an important attribute. And also, I guess, you know, Craig, you asked, you know, uh, again, the relationships of having your counterparty or the partners that you work with, whether again, interest rates, commodities, whatever it is, having that relationship that when things go um, wrong or when you need a favor, you can ask for it, right? And that just, that that's not something that turns on with a switch. You have to build that over time, build the trust, you know, make sure each party knows that they're valuable to you. And, uh, and then, um, and then you'll have that for, uh, that, relationship in place, the relationship capital when you need it. Well, and I'll make one comment too, additionally from uh, what Ron had said, and he t- he's taught me lots of things. Uh, I've enjoyed working on with him and understanding these things is kind of fun, but you know, there are a bit, you have the ability, I mean, remember while you're asleep, the currency market isn't, so you can put your orders in. You can put orders in that are protecting you on the, on the downside. And if you're looking for some upside, you just put your orders in. Maybe you're lucky enough to wake up in the morning and find that they all all filled. And that's the nice thing about it. And it is a little bit, again, we talk about the, the, the stock market. But if you know your risk and you know where you're going, uh, you know, where you have some, where your points are, where you have a pain point and where maybe you don't want to see it get above that, then you better put a stop loss in. And uh, But you can try uh, limit trades to get you into the... Um, you know, to help you gain some upside when you when you can. And I think that's the best way to play the markets. I also remember, Ron, you probably remember this, that I was I was on a business trip to Europe, but I had my son with me. So I was entering in my uh, my vacation time and it was Brexit. And that was another day where the markets were in absolute turmoil. And we kind of knew where our exposures were and where we were happy placing orders and we could find a way to make some orders at a, a more favorable point for the company, that was great. I mean, those are interesting days because whenever there's a lot of turmoil, there's uh, you see the ability to lock some, in some profits sometimes. Thank you both for your time on this podcast. I want to head to the final section where I just get some words, advi- words of advice or any final thoughts you have. And uh, maybe Steve, we can start with you and then end with Ron. Um, you know, what, what piece of advice would you give to a seasoned professional or those who are new in risk management? What would be a summary thing that you would want them to understand? Well, I think number one, it would be mainly to look at, understand your business. We always say everybody needs to understand their business, but you understand it better by the crisis. You understand it better by the, by the model of the stress testing your model. So we make sure that you have looked at what might, you know, people always use these trendy words like the black swan event, et cetera. Well, what happens if you see a move that moves you this far down in your hedging, this far down in your cash flow, this much of a disruption, what would you do? And I think the other thing is examine your partners, both uh, from your, you talking about banking partners, but also with other people in your supply chain who could you push if you had to? Where are the soft spots in the supply chain? Who is an absolute don't touch partner? And I think by doing that, you understand exactly what you would do in these types of scenarios. Because we always liked, as Ron pointed out, you talk about the good days, everybody loves that, but the bad days are what's going to surprise you. And if we look at people around the world, I think that this is the most important thing. Would we have ever thought that no one would be going to movie theaters all this time? Well, what if you own a movie theater? What are you gonna do? I think that would be my, my piece of advice. Great. Thanks, Steve and Ron. The best companies have kind of a defined chain of command, meaning they're ready to, re- to react and act when needed. Uh, that can come through developing a risk management policy that's not just in someone's head, but actually formally written out, but empowering the treasury staff or the people involved in the finance group to act you know, opportunistically within the boundaries or defined boundaries that the corporation has. Um, I'd also say, uh, don't be afraid of foreign exchange, right? I've seen treasurers spend hours going over an interest rate swap because they're very comfortable talking U.S. interest rates, but they're uncomfortable talking foreign exchange just because they don't know it. But that's where your salesperson and counterparties come in. Find the trusted ones that can help you become comfortable with it. It's their job to, you know, make you, make you look good or perform well within your organization. Um, but definitely the, the, the FX component and maybe even the commodity component, I will oftentimes see people shy away from it because they just don't understand it. Therefore, they don't give it the time that it needs. Um, and I think I've said this before, it's kind of obvious, but know your business, 
by that I'm saying, you know, just be aware of your uh, sales um, or, or your purchases. Um, you know, Steve is a shining example of being dialed into the sales groups around, the, around uh, his organization. Um, and that allows you to act. And so again, the, the FP&A cycle, all of that is part of it. Use technology to your advantage that you can be well-informed if you're the treasurer or the treasury staff. Um, and lastly, I, I just say, you know, have relationships, relationship capital built up. Um, you just do that by being, you know, good partners to each other over time. Um, but it definitely, in a moment of a crisis, it, it'll help you out. Excellent. You guys had a, certainly a few of those uh, overlap nicely, and, and there's a lot uh, from that. So, uh, Ron and Steve, thank you so much for your time on this uh, episode. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.